Hello and welcome back. I'm Jason, and today we're diving into a story that proves that Mother Nature might just be the ultimate nuclear engineer. That's right, folks, we're talking about Oklo, the only known naturally occurring nuclear reactor on Earth. Who knew that while we humans were busy inventing the wheel, the Earth was quietly running its own nuclear power plant in what we now call Gabon, Africa. Talk about being ahead of the curve. I want you to let that sink in. It took humans thousands of years to understand nuclear reactions and construct nuclear power plants. But there's strong evidence that there's a natural nuclear reactor right here on Earth, or at least it was running right here on Earth. So grab your Geiger counters and your hazmat suits as we explore this radioactive riddle wrapped in a geological enigma. Now before we get into the nitty gritty of the only known natural nuclear reactor on Earth, let's take a minute to break down what we actually mean by a nuclear reaction and how it differs from the chemical reactions that we see in everyday life. Now, chemical reactions involve ultimately the rearrangements of atoms. The atoms themselves stay intact, but they form new molecules by sharing or exchanging electrons. So it mostly involves the electrons around the atoms. This is what happens when you bake a cake or when rust forms on metal or even when you strike a match. The atoms are just getting cozy with new partners, but their nuclei stay unchanged. The core idea is that the chemistry involves the rearrangements of the atoms and the movement of the electrons that surround the atoms in some way. Nuclear reactions, on the other hand, involve changes in the nucleus of the atom, the dense center made up of the protons and the neutrons in the center. In a nuclear reaction, these nuclear particles are rearranged, and the identity of the atom itself is actually changed. This process releases an enormous amount of energy compared to chemical reactions. And while a chemical reaction might release a few electron volts of energy, that's a common unit in physics, a nuclear reaction can release millions Millions of electron volts. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, for any chemical reaction you can come up with, you know, sodium plus chlorine makes sodium chloride, that's table salt. Hydrogen plus oxygen combust together, that makes H2O, water. Any reaction that you can come up with, the atoms themselves, the identity of the atoms does not change. So maybe the sodium goes and combines with something, or maybe the hydrogen goes and combines with something, but the identity of the hydrogen itself didn't change. The identity of the oxygen didn't change, but combining with new atoms makes a unique molecule which has unique properties. And in the recombination process, the nuclei didn't change, but all the electrons around there actually in some form or fashion, at least the outermost electrons, got either rearranged or uh, given to another partner or shared in some sort of way. So we say that chemical reactions mostly involve electrons, and the identity of the atoms themselves basically stay the same in the nucleus. But in a nuclear reaction, that's why it's called a nuclear reaction to differentiate it from a chemical reaction, the nucleus itself can change. The nucleus, the identity of the atom, is governed by the number of protons in the nucleus. And to a lesser degree, the number of neutrons can affect the weight and sometimes the behavior of the atom, but it's mostly the protons in the nucleus. And if you change the number of protons, if a proton pops out or if a proton gets removed somehow, or if a atom splits in half into two smaller nuclei or gets fused together into a larger nuclei, then the nucleus has changed in some way. And then it changes from one atom to a totally different atom atom on the periodic table. So in a chemical reaction, the identity of the atoms doesn't change. Hydrogen stays hydrogen. Oxygen stays oxygen. It's the outer electrons that are mostly doing the moving and the rearrangement of the atoms. But in a nuclear reaction, the actual nucleus changes. And that means that an atom on the periodic table becomes a new and different kind of atom. That is a nuclear reaction. Now I'd like to take a second to talk about nuclear chain reactions. This is the key to both nuclear power and also nuclear weapons. In order for us to talk about nuclear chain reactions, which is critical to all of this stuff, I wanna talk about the nucleus of the atom for a second. So you know that there are protons in that nucleus and there's also neutrons in that nucleus. And if you look on the periodic table, you can figure out exactly how many of each are in every nucleus of the atoms that we know about. 
The protons themselves are positively charged in the nucleus. And if you remember, positive charges like to repel each other. So that means, and the neutrons don't have any charge. So that means in the nucleus, all of the protons are trying to be forced apart from each other. So have you ever thought about it? Why does the nucleus stay together at all? Why does it just explode? Because they're all positive charges, the neutrons don't have any charges, and they're trying to, to, to force themselves apart. So how does it stay together? And the answer to that is there's an even stronger force than that electric repulsion, and that's called the strong nuclear force. And it's one of the four fundamental forces of nature. Now that force is millions of times stronger than that electric repulsion, so it can hold the nucleus together. Um, but it only acts on very short distances. So it only really acts inside the nucleus of the atom. It doesn't really reach across the universe like a proton here and a proton here. You can feel a force between them. But inside the nucleus, it's millions of times stronger than anything else, so it holds it together. Now here's the thing. Protons are in the nucleus and neutrons are in the nucleus, and they both generate the strong nuclear force holding it together. Um, so you need some neutrons in the nucleus to thin out the protons and generate enough of that strong force to hold it together. But here's the problem. If you have too many neutrons, then what's happening is uh, the nucleus gets too physically large for that strong force to hold it together because remember the strong force only acts over very short distances. So if you make a nucleus with too many neutrons, it becomes what we call unstable and it begins to become radioactive. That means the nucleus decays spontaneously. One of the neutrons might change into a different particle or pop off or whatever. There's a whole bunch of things that can happen there. And the same thing happens if you have too few neutrons. If you have too few neutrons, then you have other problems with the forces holding the nucleus together, and it again becomes unstable. So for every atom on the periodic table, you have a finite amount of protons for the identity of the atom, and you have to have some range of of neutrons to actually have enough strong force to hold it together. And these are the isotopes that you might have heard about. You know, carbon-12, then you have carbon-14. The numbers at the end are referencing basically the different number of neutrons that are in there. And the, if you have too many neutrons, it's unstable. And if you have too few neutrons, it's also unstable. And what I mean by that is it's radioactive. All right, and so you hear about uranium-238 or plutonium and different isotopes and things like this. And those, again, are isotopes that are necessary for the nuclear reaction to happen. Because what you want is something that's a little bit unstable that you can sort of control the reaction. And I'm gonna talk about how exactly the chain reaction happens in just a second. So hold that in the back of your mind, and I want you now to imagine that you're at a bowling alley. But instead of bowling balls, you're throwing neutrons at a bunch of uranium atoms, which are arranged like pins down at the end. Now I want you to remember that the uranium atoms are a little bit unstable in the nucleus. When a neutron comes flying down and hits that uranium nucleus just right, it can split the nucleus, and that releases a lot of energy, but it also releases more neutrons. And these new neutrons go on to then impact other atoms and split them and release even more neutrons and more energy. And this cascade of splitting atoms is what we call a nuclear chain reaction. Now, if you have a controlled environment like a nuclear reactor, this chain reaction is carefully calculated and managed and designed to produce a steady supply of energy that doesn't fluctuate and doesn't go out of control. Now, in an uncontrolled environment, well, that's when you get a mushroom cloud and a very bad day because it's an uncontrolled release of energy. So that's the basic idea here. You have some sort of radioactive heavy atom on the periodic table, right? And if you hit it just right with a neutron, it can split and release energy, which is heat, and more neutrons. Those neutrons that are liberated can go and impact other atoms that are nearby, which then split those guys and they make more energy and more neutrons, and then the whole thing can happen. And if you have what we call a critical mass of, for instance, uranium, where the atoms are close enough together, where the atoms are close enough together where the neutrons can, can very efficiently impact their neighbors, then you get a very rapid chain reaction. And in a fraction of a millisecond, the whole thing happens with a chain reaction. That's how you have a bomb. Now, in a nuclear power plant, things are designed so that everything is slow and steadily uh, controlled. So you have the uh, radioactive material, you have the neutrons hitting their neighboring atoms, but they're not in a critical mass situation to go in an uncontrolled chain reaction. They're spaced out in such a way that they can't really ever uh, have that chain reaction happen in an uncontrolled way. If you want to generate more electricity, you have what we call control rods, which are either put in or pulled out of the reactor, which can absorb neutrons 
or reflect neutrons, depending on how it's actually constructed. Because remember, neutrons are like the bowling balls. They're what's actually impacting and causing the chain reaction to happen. And if you put your control rods in and absorb the extra neutrons, all right, uh, graphite for instance, then what you can do is you can slow down the chain reaction. You can slow down the number of megawatts the power plant is actually creating or generating. And if you pull your control rods out, then you have more neutrons in the chamber and then you can increase the power output of your power plant. But the idea is you wanna be able to control it with some sort of mechanism to be able to throttle the neutrons and throttle the output of the power plant very controllably. Now, before we dive deeper into Oclo's mysteries and the naturally occurring reactions, let's take a moment to understand why splitting atoms actually releases energy in the first place. And honestly, it's a good question. It sounds like a simple question, but it's really not a simple question at all. I want you to imagine that you have a big, heavy atom like uranium. It is a very large nucleus, and so it isn't really entirely stable. It has positive protons that are all repelling each other, but the strong nuclear force is barely holding the whole thing together. Now, if we split that atom, we're giving the nucleus a little bit of a push. Suddenly, our uranium atom splits into two smaller atoms who are in lower energy states, which means they're more stable. Now, here's the punchline. The difference in the energy from the large atom, which was unstable and what we call high potential energy, to two smaller atoms, which by definition have to be more stable because they're smaller and it's not as radioactive because it's not as unstable, that's a lower energy state. And the difference between that high potential energy for the first big heavy atom and the smaller lower energy state of the two smaller atoms, that energy has to go somewhere. And that goes into the energy of moving everything around. That's the energy we see in a nuclear reaction or in a nuclear bomb. So the energy is released because of the difference in the energy from the unstable atom initially to the two smaller, more stable atoms at the end. Basically, that energy release means that the products after the reaction happen, they fly apart at high speed. Basically, the nucleus of the product atoms are packed tighter together and they're held together better in a more stable way. And their nuclear, the nucleus is moving very, very fast afterwards because the difference in energy goes into the movement of those daughter nuclei after the reaction happens. This is a really loose analogy, but you can kind of think of it as a rubber band. If you stretch in a rubber band, it's at a high potential energy state, right? And then if you let it go, and then it goes back to its very uh, normal undisturbed state, it's at what we call a low potential energy state. So what's gonna happen? Initially, it's at a high energy state, then the final state's at a low energy state, so where does the difference in energy go? It goes into the motion of the rubber band, and the rubber band flies across the room. So those uh, the, the, the parent nuclei, the heavy nuclei, is very unstable in a very high potential energy state. Once it splits, it goes into two smaller atoms that are in a lower energy state. The difference in energy goes into the motion of the daughter nuclei that are produced. That is what we call the heat of the reaction. That's the energy that's released in the nuclear reaction. So the energy that's released is mostly in the form of kinetic energy of the daughter nuclei. They zoom apart at high speed, and when these speedy particles collide with other atoms in the surrounding material, they transfer their energy, causing the material to heat up, and voila, that's how we get the heat from nuclear fission. All right, so how does this all relate to OCLO, the natural nuclear reactor we believe we found on Earth? Well, in 1972, French scientists were analyzing uranium samples from the OCLO mine in the Gabon region when they noticed something odd. The proportion of uranium-235, which is the isotope used in nuclear reactors and in nuclear bombs, it was lower than what it should have been. It was as if the uranium had already been used in some kind of reactor, but this was natural ore straight out of the ground. After much head scratching and probably a few spilled beakers of celebratory champagne, the scientists realized that they had stumbled upon evidence of a natural nuclear reactor that had operated about 1.7 billion, that's with a B, billion years ago. But how do we know this wasn't just some sort of weird geological fluke? Well, the evidence is pretty compelling. You see, the depleted uranium-235 levels match what we'd expect to see in a spent nuclear fuel. Scientists found fission products, which are the elements left over after the uranium atom split, the daughter elements I talked about, they found those in the ore, in the mine. And the distribution of those fission products matched the patterns that we see in modern nuclear reactors. So we have like neodymium and ruthenium isotopes, and they were found in ratios that can really only be explained by nuclear fission. 
So it'd sort of be loosely like finding a prehistoric McDonald's. The leftovers might look a little bit different, but you can still recognize by the packaging the half-eaten burger, to use a rough analogy. Now, before you start worrying about stumbling into a natural nuclear reactor on your next hiking trip, rest assured that Oklo isn't currently active. The conditions that actually allowed it to operate were unique to Earth's distant past. About 1.7 billion years ago, the concentration of uranium-235 in natural uranium was much higher. It was about 3.7% compared to today's percentage, about 0.72%. This higher concentration, combined with the presence of groundwater, act as a moderator, which slows down the neutrons, making them more likely to cause fission. And they created the perfect conditions for a natural nuclear reactor. Now these Oklo reactors, yes, there were actually several of them found in the Oklo region, operated in pulses. This is really interesting. They would run for about 30 minutes, then they would shut down for about two and a half hours as the water that moderated the reaction boiled away. Once things cooled down after uh, some period of time, the reaction would return and the cycle would start up again. This cycle continued for hundreds of thousands of years until the uranium-235 was too depleted to sustain the reaction. So, it begs the question, how does Oklo compare to our modern nuclear reactors? How does it stack up? Well, let's just say that if Oklo were a student in nuclear reactor school, it would probably get an A-plus for effort, but it might need some remedial classes in efficiency and safety. Here are some basic similarities between the Oklo reactor and a modern reactor. Both of them use uranium-235 as the fuel. Both of them relied on controlled nuclear chain reactions. Both of them produced similar fission products. Both of them used water as a moderator, although in different ways, really. Now here are some big, big picture differences between Oklo and a modern reactor. The power output for Oklo produced a very small 100 kilowatts of power, compared to a modern reactor, which would be hundreds of megawatts for a modern nuclear reactor. For the efficiency, Oklo operated in fits and starts, starting up and shutting down, while today we strive for continuous operation. For containment, Oklo was all natural, so to speak, while we use sophisticated containment structures in case anything actually goes wrong. And also, we also use control rods and other mechanisms to manage the reaction, while Oklo relied on groundwater for the most part to moderate the reaction. Now, as far as safety features, let's just say Oklo didn't really have an emergency shutdown system or any kind of cooling towers of that nature. Now there you have it, folks, the tale of Oklo, Earth's very own nuclear science experiment. It goes to show that sometimes life just finds a way to split atoms and to release energy on a massive scale. Now the next time you're feeling very proud of human technological achievements, I want you to remember that Mother Nature had a 1.7 billion year head start in the nuclear reactor game. But don't worry, I'm pretty sure she's not working on a secret underwater reactor or a volcano-powered atomic reactor. At least I hope not, but maybe we should check just to be sure. I'm Jason. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate all of your comments and feedback. I read every single comment. So I invite you to drop me a line, let me know what you think. And as you walk around and contemplate the mysteries of nuclear reactions, I want you to always remember to stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.